How do you pick the right camera? The camera you choose can make or break your projects. However, choosing the right tool for the job isn't always about the technical aspects of the piece of gear. Sometimes, it's about how that product makes you feel. In my opinion, when choosing which camera is right for you, there are two questions you should ask yourself. What do I want the final image to look like? And how difficult is it going to be to achieve that look with that camera? In this video, I want to show you my brand new camera that I believe answers these two questions better than any other camera I've ever used. Gotta have the cliche chicken dance. I gotta say, I have spent almost a decade building up rig cameras. Part of me loves doing it. It's kind of like building a PC, adding parts to a car. It's fun to get in there and make something that is like, feels like just yours. Like you just wrap your cables a certain way. You put this accessory over on this thing and, and that's cool. But I gotta say, it is so nice picking up a camera package that is filled with features and there's like no cables in sight. Like there's the cable that connects the monitor to the body, but even that is like cable managed out of the box. I've never touched it. And besides that, there is, there's no other cables. Everything is perfectly engineered to work together and it just works like a well-oiled machine. And if you yourself are tired of rigging up cameras all the time, make sure you stick around towards the end of this video because I'm gonna talk about one of the biggest benefits of why you would choose a camera like this over throwing your regular camera on a gimbal. The camera is not brand new. What is coming out today is the DJI 17 to 28 DL lens. It's the latest addition to the DJI professional lens lineup. And honestly, it is by far their best lens ever. But don't just take my word for it as I'm a newbie to the DJI Ronin 4D world. So I wanted to get the opinion of someone who has not only had the 4D since before it was ever launched to the Public, but a guy who has battle tested not only every other DJI lens, but probably almost every other lens out there. Michael, welcome to the club, buddy. Look how look how nice his looks. Mine looks like it's been left out on the street for a year. His is all brand new. I was gonna say, to be fair, I literally got it a week ago. Does your top handle still not work? <laughs> so my top hand, my top handle is older firmware from when I was beta testing when the Rona 4D first came out. So mine technically doesn't work. Oh, gosh, that's, that is so damn nice. DJI, I want a new top handle. This is where DJI started from. Okay, that was first on their yeah, this is this, Yeah, this is the 16 millimeter, and here's their 50. So like, the, these are the original DL lenses. They only have four lenses, okay. and now this makes up their fifth lens. The build quality of this lens is quite interesting. It's physically a lot larger than their other lenses. It definitely feels like it fits nicer into this professional camera body, unlike the drone. And it's got a really nice matte box style removable lens hood. Now to be honest with my limited knowledge of technical lens design and optics, I've always thought that the smaller the lens element, the cheaper the quality or the less light that gets in, but nowadays it doesn't really seem like that's the case. But you know what's interesting is that there's some really good like vintage Russian lenses that are surprisingly sharp and fast and tiny. Mm. So like optic, optical design, there are definitely trade-offs. And I used to think that the bigger the lens, the better. I no longer think that. You know, comparing it to like the 50 and the 35, the image sharpness is 
tack sharp. You have to understand that DJI, from a clinical point of view, they are wanting to give you the sharpest lenses possible because their background is drones, right? So True. with drone, with aerial footage, you're not going to be, <laughs> you don't really care about bokeh or, you know, character. You're just trying to get all of the details in there. And I think that's what they channeled into here for the Ronin 4D. And what Josh said was true. Whether I'm at 17 millimeter or 28, this lens is just tack sharp. And most importantly, it retains that sharpness from the center to the edges. With this shot of Michelle I got, I kept the lens at F2.8 or T3, and I moved the camera around so that she would go from center to the edges. And of course at 17 millimeter, you can definitely see some distortion. I'm not gonna call this a zero distortion lens, but in terms of sharpness, it retains that clarity all the way over. In terms of optics, this lens has beautiful highlight roll off. When it flares, it gives off a subtle but beautiful glow if you're more wide open. And even the bokeh, that shot in the intro where it says introducing and has all the lights behind it, that was a room in Otherworld where we shot all that neon-y stuff and I just threw the lens super out of focus. That's what the bokeh looks like. It's really nice and like almost perfectly spherical. It's got a shockingly close minimum focus range as well. And so you can get so close to subjects but still retain that kind of wide field of view allowing you to get the surroundings but have a separation from the subject that's close up and of course once you go all the way to the 28 millimeter you start to get the sense that you're using a portrait lens as much as i wish that they were able to push it to 35 millimeter again josh had a good opinion as to why they couldn't i was a little bit bummed out that they did 17 to 28 and they didn't do a 16 to 35, right? Yeah. But then I was like, well, you can always just switch it to super 35 mode. You're still mm -hmm. getting 4K. And then it turns the 28 into a 42. So you That's could true. be, it's a 17 to 42. In multiple times in the past couple of weeks, I've taken his suggestion up of going into the super 35 mode, going to 4K, and whether I'm at 4K 24 or 4K 120, I now have a 40 or 42 millimeter lens that gets me even tighter without having to swap lenses. This lens paired with the 4D's full frame 6K sensor with 14 stops of dynamic range, 805,000 native ISO, produces a level up image quality from my Blackmagic Pocket 6K Pro that I have been dying for. In terms of codecs, you pretty much have every flavor of ProRes. Now, unfortunately for me, this is kind of a step back as B-Raw is such an amazing codec that I do find myself missing for both file sizes as well as optimizations running on my computer. But nonetheless, ProRes makes things playing back on pretty much any device incredibly easy, so that is a bonus. I did do a quick test, testing H.264 all the way up to 444XQ to see can you really tell the difference and what codec should you be shooting with this camera probably going to be hard to tell with a compressed YouTube video. You can definitely feel and see the difference. There's just way more data packed into each pixel on the XQ. But considering shooting about 11 minutes worth of footage at Otherworld took about 670 or something gigs. For me, I've landed on shooting honestly ProRes LT. Seeing DJI come out with this new lens makes me excited because while a lot of people had doubts as to if they were going to add anything to this camera or their lens lineup. This just proves that they're not giving up on this line of camera or lenses anytime soon, and I can't wait to see what other zoom lenses or prime lenses they plan on coming out with. Oh, by the way, mine has an umbilical cord. If you guys want to know what the hell this flex cable is and what it can do, then just watch my video. Now at the time of this recording, I don't have specific price points, but I do know where it's relatively going to sit and the benefits of buying this lens as a 4D user over third-party ones. Comparing it to the cheaper line of lenses, you're going to get much sharper optics and you're getting a T3 or F2.8 lens. And so for the price, it's a very fast lens. When you compare it to other similar quality lenses like the Sony 16 to 35 Goldmaster, you can save yourself so much money and have a better integrated lens. 
All right, so now I'm doing an audio test where I've plugged in my Sennheiser MK440. I wanted to see if I could hear the zoom lens because that was kind of loud. Yeah, you definitely hear that. That sounds like an old camcorder. People doing a lot of zoom in and zoom out with the microphone directly attached to the camera. That's something that it seems like you're definitely going to hear. The setup of this camera is so like tightly integrated with the first party accessories. I was really nervous to add even just a microphone on top because it's adding like a third party thing that like shouldn't exist on it. But with this simple swivel hot shoe mount, it's really low profile. It doesn't get in the way of the handle usage. Like this is the perfect YouTube setup for me as, as someone who has, again, never had autofocus or a built-in screen to really see myself easily this is great. So now speaking of integrations, let's move on to answering question two. How do you achieve the look that you want with as minimal issues or the camera technology getting in your way? I am someone who completely loves a mix of style of shots. I love the fact that I can turn on the four axis stabilization and get the smoothest shots while sprinting down the road. But a lot of time I also love locking up the gimbal functionality and just using it as a regular handheld camera. Both of these scenarios takes a matter of second switching and it doesn't require any switch out of gear. You all know how much I love my DJI RS3 Pro. I've made so many videos on the combination of this and my Pocket 6K Pro, and it's very fast and efficient. I can literally just take my camera, slide it on, lock it in, and if I had a lens on, it would be ready to go. And so for this style of camera setup, it's still my favorite option out there. But the problems come into play that a lot of time when I go out to film, I am by myself and I know a lot of you are too. And so what happens when you want to switch from gimbal to handheld mode? You just take the camera off, right? And now you're handheld. But now you have this very expensive high value item and you're kind of just like, okay, where do I put this? You kind of just put it off to the ground and keep an eye on it, hope it doesn't get stolen. Do you put it back in the carrying case, which is a whole other thing because this is so well balanced to my 6K Pro to make it fast and efficient that when I pack it up, I don't really pack it up. I just sit it in the seat next to me in the car because I don't want to mess with the having to rebalance completely every time I tear down and set up. This is the first camera that I actually bring the carrying case that it came with. And with under two minutes, I can get it completely set up or torn down and everything packed away. This is the first camera in a very long time that actually makes me excited to shoot because it doesn't make me feel like I'm limited by anything. There's an incredibly bright screen with multiple functions that even pass my winter glove test. How easy it is to operate this camera with thick winter gloves. Winter gloves on. Just holding the camera is still just as comfortable. The grips definitely allow room. As far as the touchscreen goes, I love the fact that although these gloves have the touch sensors, if these weren't, everything on my main menu in terms of the stuff I need quick access to, I have a physical button on top or bottom and then a scroll wheel and the dial that I can easily use to change those settings. So in my opinion, this camera passes the winter glove test. So sometimes when I'm talking about camera menu systems, I feel like I'm being too harsh to other brands and like maybe just Blackmagic and DJI's menus are, you know, superior, but the other brands aren't that bad. My buddy Cliff lent me his Sony FX3, which is a fantastic camera, no doubt. But when I first turned it on, how much info do they pack on a three inch screen? That is bananas. Again, I know it's something you just like learn over time, but that is, that is bad. Like this menu screen, just perfect. So yeah, FX3, great camera. The red record button, those two things, that, that's, that's badass. But I don't know how anyone honestly could tell me that this is a good UI design. While there aren't a ton of mounting points on here, there is one hot shoe and a couple quarter 20s and 5.8s on the back, but this hot shoe 
perfectly allows me to put my Sennheiser MKE 440 right there. It plugs right into the mic jack. Yes, I wish they would come out with their XLR expansion port. And if you're coming from Blackmagic cameras like me and you're used to shooting on to SSDs and then being able to directly plug it in and use this just as an SSD that you can move other folders and files onto, the batteries. Well, at first I was like, man, why didn't they just go with generic V mounts? Again, I just love that it's all one integrated system. The battery costs aren't that bad. And considering it is one battery to power everything you see here, minus the microphone, and you get a solid like two hours-ish, maybe a little less if you're using a ton of the uh, Z axis. But honestly, they charge so fast. Usually by the time one is completely emptied, the other one is ready to go. I definitely plan on picking up another one, maybe even two batteries, and then I will be good for an all day shoot. But it has been so nice not having to be like, okay, do I have my camera batteries? Do I have my gimbal batteries? Do I have my monitor batteries? I have never experienced a faster lens mount swap than on this system. In real time, I'm going to take off this DL lens and lens mount and attach a Sony E mount with a E to EF adapter so I can use my IREX lenses. Don't blink. New mount on. And now I have my EF lenses adapted to it. But with these, I can hook up the focus motor attachment and still be able to use the focus wheel on the side. Or if you want to go old school, you could just like take off this left handle here or something if you wanted to and hold it underneath. And now you have a much more traditional camera solo operator setup. And so anyone who says this camera is limited by the lenses you can use on it, I, I understand where they're coming from. Once you get to something like Atlas anamorphic lenses, which are really big and really heavy, then I've seen people get plates and you get a big lens support thing. So it's definitely still possible, but maybe a little less practical than some other cameras out there. But if you're in the general realm of any photography lenses or cine lenses like these IRIX or DZO, they can work on this camera wonderfully. I just realized for this whole video, I didn't have the uh, LiDAR on top. A screen that actually rotates over and goes at any angle and I can push a button to flip the screen orientation. I can finally see myself. I have autofocus with cine lens level of optics. Now obviously if you're watching this video and you are the type of person who wants to grab a very small high-end mirrorless camera just to be able to vlog, shoot yourself, make the content you want to make, I completely get it. I get why this camera is not for everyone. But if you are into honestly just most genres I can think of, this camera really isn't a toy, a gimmick, or honestly what I always thought it was, a specialty cam that you kind of have to use as a B cam. It feels wrong to say it, but I really think I found my new A cam. In a couple weeks or a month or so, I'm going to be doing a follow up video to this. I want to see if my love for this camera continues to shine bright as time goes on. And I want to be able to answer your questions in the next video. So make sure you leave a comment down below with any questions you may have on the camera, concerns, thoughts, anything like that. And I'll be answering them over on social media. Make sure you follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Initial Focus. I'm starting to post a lot more there. So I'll do one-off videos answering questions about this camera. If you enjoyed this video, I'd very much appreciate if you hit that subscribe button. And thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.